Welcome to another basketball question and answer session. Today, I'm going to be focusing on shot technique and questions related to shooting. If you're someone that wants to better understand how to improve your shot or how to improve the shot of the athletes that you work with, then hopefully some of the answers to the questions that people have asked uh, will benefit you and the athletes in your program. So getting straight into it today and this one is one that can confuse a number of people which is basically what's the difference between a runner and a floater so there are some coaches that i know locally that don't teach a difference between a runner and a floater they just call everything a floater and or a runner but from a state performance program point of view what we were taught in our state program here in queensland there is actually a difference that we teach our athletes. So if you're a coach who may not be aware that there is a difference, then there are coaches that teach the difference which is related to two things, which is the footwork and the release. Now, I do have information on this channel that will demonstrate for athletes and coaches both the runner footwork and the floater footwork. So we'll talk about the runner footwork first. So basically a runner is a shot that's like a layup but taken a little bit further out and has the same footwork. So basically what that means is players who are, make a normal layup are going to make a layup off one foot normally. That's a normal layup. So what a runner is, is it's actually taken a bit further out away from the charge circle, normally shooting over a larger defender and it's got the same footwork. So what's the difference between a runner and a floater? Well, the floater actually is a different type of shot. It's a two-footed shot. So it, you take off two feet. And the other thing that makes it different that coaches tend to teach is that you don't have a lock and snap. So instead of flicking your wrist, you actually push the ball and you finish with a nice high teardrop type arc. So if you are wondering what the difference between a runner and a floater is, basically they're two different things. Each one has different footwork and a different finish. So if you're a junior coach that didn't know that, then leave a comment in the section below. If you disagree, leave a comment in the section below because I know there are coaches that don't differentiate between the two. However, I would argue that they are actually different shot types. If you think about if you're teaching and instructing people to do a Euro, you're not going to call that a layup because it has different footwork. So why would you say that a runner and a floater are actually the same when they actually have different footwork and they have a different finish? So hopefully that helps answer the question that the individual had there, which is what's the difference between a runner and a floater? We'll go to the next question, shooting secrets. There's actually two questions and I've put them together in this one. I'll just read these for you. I can't shoot and I need help. That's just about everyone, including myself. My problem is that my shot somehow finds a way to roll to the left sometimes when I shoot, and I can feel the ball kind of rolling off my finger to go to the left. They say their elbow's straight, then they have good placement of the ball. So they're saying they feel everything's right, but they're having problems rolling off the finger. The next one, perfect release, is a similar question. That's why I've thrown them together, which is saying the same sort of thing. How do I get the ball to release off either my middle finger or both my index and middle finger every time I shoot. A common question that athletes may have if they're shooting and they're finding that their fingers are affecting their shot, then they often will predict that it may be coming off an incorrect finger. Now that's not always the case, but it can be. So what are some of the things that cause a shot to go off? Now certainly the finger and the way you release the shot will impact where the shot goes that that goes without saying probably but what i find is a lot of coaches teach players how to shoot so they'll teach them the technique but what they don't do is teach them how to recognize why they made or missed a shot so this is what we're talking about here this is the question okay so i'll answer the question that's in there first and i'll add some stuff to it so I'll just grab prop which is a ball so this ball here if i was shooting the ball and i want it to come off these fingers then obviously i don't want these three fingers to impact the ball so what a lot of the better shooters do is they will actually put their fingers together they'll pinch their fingers so the argument being there that if you have a straight arm and your fingers pointing at the basket you don't want these fingers to impact the ball 
you want this finger to impact the ball. So one of the way to get these three out of the way is to actually pinch your finger. So when you shoot the ball, you'll see some players like Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, Kevin Durant. There are images of them actually pinching their finger on the release of their shot. The argument being that these three fingers are going to shoot the ball off potentially in a different direction. The important thing here to note is the direction the ball actually goes, because it might not be the fingers that are actually causing the ball to go left or right. So if your ball is going to the right of the basket, it's probably that your elbow's out if you're a right-hand shooter. What I'm going to share here will be opposite if you're actually a left-hand shooter. So just flip what I say here. So right-hand shooter, elbow out, ball's probably going to go to the right of the basket. If you find that it's going to the left of the basket, you're probably twisting your body or you're turning your feet on the shot. So that can cause the ball to go in the opposite direction. Then the challenge really is whether you are shooting short or long. So what I often say is a straight shot is a good shot, which is why this question is important, is because you're trying to say, I want the ball to be straight. So if you can finish with your point, your fingers pointing at the rim, that is definitely a good start. And just be aware that you can turn your body on, on the shot, particularly younger players will, will twist their body or they jump and they turn their feet. The one thing I did as a younger man myself is I used to put my head on my shoulders. I shot, I didn't really realize I was doing that. So things like that, uh, you know, all contribute to the potential of a shot being made or missed. So hopefully that answers the question for that individual. Just something as simple as pinching may solve the problem if that is the cause of why you're actually missing. My son is a chest shooter. Will this fix itself over time? Now, at a young age, this is quite a common problem for athletes. At a young age, they don't have the power or strength to get the ball to the basket, particularly further out. So what they choose to do is they shoot the ball from their waist or chest. And it's almost like a Superman shot for a lot of them. They jump towards the basket as if they're going to fly like Superman. So I like to call it Supermanning. And a lot of it has to do with two things. They don't have the strength yet to make that distance. That's obvious again. We say the power comes from our legs, but they also haven't developed a good shot technique probably to really understand how to get an efficient shot. So everything's connected. So we have what we call a kinetic chain. And the kinetic chain becomes really important in developing efficiency. Now, the other question was, will they get out of that habit? Well, the short answer to that is if they're trained well and they practice and focus on all the components of a good shot, then there's every likelihood, yes, they will outgrow it. And in fact, one of the athletes that's on the OzSwish channel, I think the videos that he appeared in in 2000. 11, 12, 13, he actually shot like that as a junior and I used to, I coached him and I used to worry about it. He'd make his shots, but he developed a really nice shot as an adult and was quite successful in the teams where I coached him. So the answer to that question is yes, as long as you get some good training to instruct you how to develop that technique over time. We're not natural born shooters, most of us. So he needs to strengthen and he needs to understand how the kinetic chain works starting inside first as opposed to outside because if he's shooting like that it's probably because he's shooting at a distance so let's make sure we're working on the right things first which is having our athletes work inside first particularly at a young age so we'll go to the next one training on a nine foot two inch rim i'm just wondering if training on a rim under 10 feet will ruin my shot they're shooting on this ring that's not the right height now this is actually one of my bugbears i'm one of these guys that goes and shoots locally at local courts and particularly the outdoor ones that local councils supply here in Australia. And just about every one that I shoot on, I find to be the wrong height. So in answer to this question, if you're shooting on a lower ring, then it's most likely to damage your shot on a normal 10 foot ring. And the reason that is, is because you require less of an arc to actually get the ball in. So what that means is you're training your elbow to be lower on the shot. So the way that we would get a nice arc on our shot is to finish with what we call elbow above eyebrows. And we want to get a nice, you know, the ball dropping into the hoop because the hoop's actually the size of two size seven basketballs pretty much side by side, so two fit in. So the reason most people miss is because the trajectory or the angle is actually incorrect, all right? So one of the important things to understand there is that you want a nice arc on your shot 
and shooting on a lower ring is probably not going to get it. But interestingly, if you shoot on a ring that's slightly higher, there's every likelihood that's actually going to potentially help your shot in developing more arc or at least developing your technique. But you really just want to practice and train on the correct height if and when you can because shooting on anything other than what you need to work on or, or play on is going to impact the development of your shot technique. What we're trying to duplicate is muscle memory to the point that we don't have to think about the shot. So if you're wondering why a lot of players are effortless, they just catch the ball and let it fly, is because they trust their training. They're trusting that all the work they've done in the lead up to that game and even to the lead up to that shot has been enough for them just to trust that their body knows the distance between the ring and themselves. And this is interesting. If I threw a ball at your head right now, you're probably going to have the judgment to know how far it is and to move your head to get out of the way. So the point is we're very good at depth awareness. So we're very good at understanding how far something is. And if we want to throw something towards it, we have a very good perception of how much power we need to get it there, right? So they're just trusting their training is the short of it. So yeah, I wouldn't recommend training on a low ring and it is a common problem. We'll go to the next question. Does off the ball movement like cuts work if you're short? And he says, maybe a dumb question because there's no dumb questions here, but does cutting work at a professional level when you're short? And when they say short, they mean 5'11 five, five, to 6'2", and they're saying they're 5'11", uh, and they realize that they just stand still when they don't have the ball. You should move off the ball. It provides opportunity for you to score. And one of the best ways to do it is when guys dribble penetrate, try to get to gaps that are created by help defense. So if you're not sure where or how to move, so at my academy, we teach all different types of cuts. We teach I cut, L cut, V cut, U cut, backdoor cut. There are ways to get open off the ball. It come around to how you want to arrive at a certain spot. And the best shooters on the planet will actually know they're going to shoot the ball before they arrive. They, the moment they start to make or execute a movement or a cut, they know that if conditions are met for them to take their shot, they'll actually take the shot when they arrive. They don't wait to think about it when they've got the ball in their hands. They initiate their cut. So what I would suggest you do here, if you don't know all those cuts, go find out what different cuts there are. You also have ways to get open as teammates where you can set away screens for each other. And then you also have, obviously, your on-ball situations, which is what most, most junior coaches like to gravitate to, but it's probably one of the most complex actions you can have because you're taking an extra defender towards the ball, and it can get quite messy. So I'm a coach that likes away screens, and I like a coach that likes penetrating passes to penetrating players. And I know that that's just a style of play that I find works at a junior level really well for me and makes the defense work. Because if you're not cutting or moving, then the defense doesn't have to play defense neither. So hopefully that answers that question for you. My mind blanks when I play basketball in game situations, whether it's being in training sessions or games itself. Anytime I play basketball in game like scenarios, my mind blanks and I cannot think at all. That is another common question, particularly at a youth age and even senior age. And what it comes down to, if you're not aware, is actually fitness. So what is happening there is you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain and therefore you're not able to focus and as you get more fatigued, you're, you lose focus. So the best strategy I can offer for this and the simplest one is to learn how to breathe properly because as we get older, we tend to become what we call mouth breathers. When we're younger, we breathe through our nose, but as we get older, a lot of us develop the habit of breathing through our mouth. Now, our nose is designed to take the air straight into our windpipe and straight into our lungs to not only filter it, but also to warm it so that it's absorbed a lot better. So you actually get 20% more oxygen delivery when you actually breathe through your nose and then exhale through your mouth. So the first thing or first strategy I'd advise you as a participant in the sport who's experiencing this is that you work on your breathing first. The second thing that you can do is pace yourself. It's not uncommon, particularly for new players to the game, to go 100 mile an hour up and back, and this is where they're not getting the oxygen levels and their fitness level isn't there. And what they're doing is they're not allowing themselves to pick moments in the game to actually rest. 
So you have to identify in the game, and you'll find this at the elite level if you watch players, that they are picking and choosing their times to run lanes and they're picking and choosing their time to walk the floor and get to positions based on what opportunities present themselves in the situation that happens on court. I think you'll experience and improve in that area as you get to play more basketball. So I'm not sure how long you've played. The question doesn't really you know, give me that information. But one thing I say is you can go and do some aerobic fitness and things. But if you play a lot of basketball, you will get that match fitness. But try and work on those two things, breathing and also making sure that you're pacing yourself in game. So hopefully that helps you with that question. This is a similar question. Need to help learning how to shoot with tired legs. Now, again, it's probably similar to the last question, which is you need to pace yourself. You need to realize, particularly if you're a jump shooter, that that is actually one of the toughest things to be if you are actually a shooting guard and you're a jump shooter. The reason being because as your legs tire, it's going to affect your shot. So again, things like endurance, you have to, if you're, that's the style of play that you're choosing, you have to pace yourself, but you also have to practice that situation. So you have to spend hours longer than the game to actually try to develop having less fatigue. The other thing is if you're stopping and resting on the sideline, so you're subbed off, try and keep yourself moving because what makes your legs heavy is the lactic acid buildup in the joints. So what you need to do is make sure that if you're someone who's working hard on court, then you sit on the bench, then you go back on the court, that your legs are likely to feel heavier. And the older you are, the worse that gets. Let me tell you that you've got to keep moving when you're not in game. So make sure you're giving yourself the opportunity to keep that blood circulating and blood flowing so that lactic acid doesn't build up so you don't get those tired legs. I'll just share this strategy because it's how I trained when I was a younger man. And I used to do two two-hour training sessions a week just on my own, but everything I did was full court. So, and, and, and it was literally two hours of shooting, but I knew if I could sustain two hours of shooting and setting goals and things, that what would happen is when I come to game, which was around 40, 50 minutes of play in a running clock game, uh, then I knew that I wasn't going to tire. So that would be a recommendation too, is overtrain so that when you come to play, you're playing less time than you would normally train and you'll find that your legs won't be as heavy. Okay, mid-range over threes. I always wanted to be a three-point shooter, which at one point I was, but I could only shoot threes and nowhere else. So when I took basketball seriously, I started to study one of his favorite players. They were good at scoring and isolating. The one thing that I saw was that they were getting a lot of points mid-range. So I started practicing mid-range every day and not shooting a single three. And they say their scoring ability was better and they were feeling unstoppable when playing against friends. They're recommending that younger hoopers potentially do the same. I'm not sure what age they actually are here, but... This mid-range shooting thing, I, I put the shot chart there. So the NBA shot chart has evolved, as many people would know, over years. So down there, is, this is one team. This is 2015-2016 Golden State Warriors. Now, on the left is every shot that was taken during that season by the team. And then on the right-hand side is the higher percentage areas. So what you notice is there are a lot of threes and there's a lot of stuff in the paint. And there's a good reason for that because as the game's changed and evolved, the reason that actually has occurred, which some people may or may not be aware of, is because analytics has changed the game. So what analytics has actually done is it's looked at what the best shot types are as far as what we call points per possession goes. And what they've found based on the average percentage, say, of a team is that you're actually better off attempting a three-point shot based on the team's percentage than shooting an intermediate or two-point shot. So the way it basically works is, so a layup, for example, might be a 90% shot. So we times that by two because you get two points for a layup. So what that is is 0.9 by two would be 1.8 points per possession, right, based on the percentage. The three-point shot, for example, it might be that the average group would shoot a clip of 40%. So it's worth three points. So we go three times the, the 40, which is would be 1.2. So 1.2 points per possession. 
Free throws, for example, might be 70% shooting. So you times that by two because you get two of those would be 1.4 points per possession. But the problem with the intermediate shot is that the best in the world shoot at 50% and the average person shooting anywhere from, you know, maybe 40 or something like that. So if you actually times that by two, you actually get a 0.8 points per possession. So you're actually getting less than a point if you are shooting that shot. So analytics work that out. So what you see in the game is this big transition over time from the shots being taken in the intermediate areas to what we see now in the last season, for example. And by the way, this isn't saying that people are not shooting the intermediate shot. This is showing where most of the shots are being taken from and the volume of them that are most successful. And what's happening is people are taking less of the intermediate. Okay, so let's wind back a little bit. And this is where I would say this is bad. Bad for the sport and bad at the junior level is because most juniors, as I mentioned earlier, cannot shoot three-point shots. So this works great if you're an NBA team, right? Having this approach that you've got to take threes and you can't shoot intermediate shots. But the reality is if you look at some of the best players in the world, like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, 52% shooters from the field, a lot of their shots came from the intermediate spot. So why do I think it's a good strategy to have a mid-range game? is because most defenses defend the paint and most defenses defend the perimeter. So if you develop a really good shot intermediately, ignoring analytics, then you're going to make a good clip of those because they're going to be easier and closer. And they're also normally taken within gaps. So they're taken where the defense doesn't tend to have coverage. So if someone drives and draws a defender, This is why I say off the ball, getting to gaps is really important because if you get to the gap and you can make that two point shot, to me, that's great. I don't care as a coach. I'm not worrying about the analytics of what they say a good shot or a bad shot is. For me, a open shot that you can make, for me is a good shot. All right, that's all I'm looking for as a coach. I'm looking for um, what we call a one on zero advantage, which is an open shot. So as much as that chart looks great and it shows how the NBA has changed, would I say that at under 12 that I would be trying to do everything from the three-point line? Of course, the answer to that's no. And I'm a big believer that you're not going to get that three-point shot unless you get the range to develop shots in other areas. And I have a saying that lightning shouldn't strike twice in the same place and nor should where you shoot from, meaning you've got to be good from everywhere. So if you're going to be that good three-point shooter, you've got to have the ability to score everywhere and anywhere on the court, in my opinion. All right. Let's move to the next question. Okay, shooting footwork. As a right-handed shooter, should I always be stepping left first, then right into my jump shot? I see people saying inside foot, then outside foot when shooting a three-pointer. It's kind of unclear which is my inside and which is my outside, as opposed to like a mid-range pull-up. They're talking about the difference. They're just basically wanting to know what is the best position for their feet to be. So... I've got a video here. I'll see if I can bring it up. We'll go this one. Now, this is a video of me as a younger man showing a continuous shooting drill. I'm going to try and pause it where I can to explain the footwork. But what you've got to be aware of is you need all different types of footwork. The footwork you're describing, the reason it's confusing is because there is jumping into a a one step, two stop or a jump stop or a hop to score. You also have a one, two step. So you need to be aware of that. You also have like a drop. So there's or dip so there's different types of ways that you catch the ball ready to shoot it based on how you're coming off say a screen or how you're coming towards the ball and the most common one that you'll hear particularly inside the paint but is also relevant to the three-pointer when you're coming from off a screen or something towards the ball and you're catching the ball to shoot it on the catch so on the receive then what's going to happen is you need to get your shot off quickly and turn on what we refer to as your inside foot. So what is the inside foot? It's often the closest foot to the basket. So if you're going to your right, your right going towards the ball, if you're doing that, the basketball should be to your left. So what's going to happen is you're going to turn your foot and move to the left. So just play this clip and we'll come out at the other end. Soft goals when you shoot and shoot with purpose at game intensity. The next drill that I want to look at will actually help you practice at game intensity. It's a continuous shooting drill. Basically, when you shoot, 
You've got to get into the habit of turning and squaring up on receiving the ball ready to shoot it. This will give you a greater chance to actually shoot the ball on the pass for a quick release. I'll now demonstrate a continuous shooting drill. Okay. Shoot the ball, hold your follow through. So as I step into this, you're going to see I do what's called open at the hip. Turn. If you look at the foot that's closest to the basket, which is my right foot here, is I started to open at the hip to take this shot. This on shot's... Um, foot. Let Try the other one play, but look at the left foot now, and it starts to turn. So I'm just turning into the shot. Pass the ball to yourself. You can fake. The idea of this drill is to shoot at game intensity or on the receive. Too often I see players catching the ball in the perfect position to shoot it, but they take too long to shoot the ball, and that window of opportunity disappears. So that footwork that you're describing there is what I would say is really important, is developing that one-two step into your shot as you're coming towards the ball. But it also depends on where the ball's passed from. So if someone kicks the ball out to you from inside the paint, then what actually happens is you're probably going to catch the ball on what we call the hop, which is a one step, two foot stop, and then load up to shoot it, particularly at the perimeter. So really you need all types of footwork. And the other one that's missing there, even though I'm turning into the shot, which is actually good because I can convert forward momentum into upward momentum, the other thing that you need to do there is actually learn to reverse pivot as well. So we didn't talk about that. And that's actually a little bit more difficult to come off and reverse pivot because you're actually going away and taking negative energy or energy away from where you want to go, which is up and towards the basket. So there are moments where you need to do all of those and you need to develop the footwork for all of those. And if you're a young player, then you definitely need those. I'll just uh, quickly say a g'day to a few people who are joining me live this morning. So thank you, Mark, for being here. I really do appreciate you dropping the hello and the good morning. It's morning here in Australia. And then also Tech for Your Needs, thank you so much for being here. Uh, happy to see you there. And also we've got Shark Fin Tech. So appreciate you guys for popping in and saying good day today on the live. So let's go to our next question. Is there anything wrong with playing slow? So a lot of people tell me that I play calm and collected, which someone said to me yesterday. And some people even feel the need to say, I have to play aggressive. I still get buckets, but one downside is I always get fouled during every drive after scoring. Basically, if they play too fast, they lose their dribble and they lose their grip on the ball and they're not able to shoot is the short of it. So what do I think about that? I think the answer to that is yes, playing slow is actually a strategy. One of the best players that I actually ever played against and the hardest to guard was a really slow player that got really good reactions out of the opponents. Now, you pointed out that you miss a lot of shots when you play fast. So I think you're playing at the pace that you feel comfortable with and I like the fact that you're actually drawing the foul and scoring, because that means you go on the line for a three-point play. So if the strategy works for you, then stay with it. Ignore what other people say, unless it's your coach that's in the style of play where they need you to be quicker. But at the end of the day, if the result's there that you're getting a foul from the opposition, which puts them into foul trouble and has to change the way they play defense, and you're also getting your bucket, then why would anyone complain except perhaps jealousy? Because like, why would you say anything? I want a teammate like that. So where I might not want the teammate to be slow is on the defensive end. So make sure you're bringing the effort and the energy at the defensive end. And I think you'll be um, a part of any winning team. Playing pace and, and the speed at which you play, obviously at certain levels, at a higher level, it would be a disadvantage. But if you're succeeding at your level, then don't change. The old adage is if something's not broken, don't try and fix it. But you could improve your speed if you wanted to and add that to your arsenal of weapons, as I like to say. All right, so we'll look at the next question. This might well be our last. There's actually two questions in here. This one's from an email. So it, it says, I have a couple of questions. How do you get your junior athletes and coaching staff 
to buy into your process and what do you do if they don't buy in? Achieving buy-in is really important because my experience as a coach is if you can't get your players on the same page, you're not gonna win anything. And this is actually why most teams lose because they're not actually teams. It takes a team with a common goal and vision to achieve that goal and vision. And if you've got one player or one person involved in that vision or dream that's spoiling because they're going after their own, so they're trying to be the guy or they're trying to just go on their own journey, that doesn't work in a team game. Have them go play tennis is what I say. Go play tennis, go play golf. That's your sport. You know, Go do something you want to do that you want to be great at, but don't impact adversely a team that's trying to achieve something together. And the reality of being part of a team, and if you're in a relationship, you probably fully get this, it's give and take. To achieve goals, you have to be prepared to collaborate and you have to be prepared to give a little to get a little. So what often happens is people feel like they're not getting their own. So how do you get this buy-in? Well, first thing is understanding the athletes you've got is that most teams have, much like chickens, a pecking order. And if there are guys at the top that have egos and, and or girls, and they're trying to be the top dog, the top guy, or the top rooster in the pen, if they're trying to be that person and there's a couple of those jockeying for that position, then you're not going to achieve what you want because they're too focused on the power play. So what you need is you do need leaders. And I normally take two people and look for these two leaders. The first one is my point guard. I need them to be an extension of me on the court. So this is the manager on the court. This is, if, I, if it was a job description, I expect them to coach the team on the court and I'll coach them on and from the sideline. So I need that leadership from them because their role is to, being the extension of me, they've got to get the other players to buy in. The other person is the captain and I don't make my captain and my point guard the same. And you can have more than one leader in a team too, by the way, they don't, title doesn't necessarily mean leadership. But I do try and identify who the best people are to bring people together at certain moments in the game. So they have clear roles and I have clear conversations with them about what my expectation of them is to get those people or the team working together. I obviously have to identify who might be going against the grain and I have hard conversations with them as to why they might be. And there's often reasons that they don't believe or buy into what it is you're selling. So what I do, particularly at a senior level, is I get the group together and I say, and I've had this happen a number of times, I say, I'm not getting what I want here, so I want you guys to sort it out. This is where I want this shot from, or this is what I want here. You guys aren't doing it, I'm not sure why, but I get my captain, my point guard, to talk not to necessarily the whole group, I get them to talk to the individuals or individual who aren't buying in, and let them have ownership of what's not working. So what I do is I put the, that person on the spot by saying, okay, you're not doing this and you're not happy with how we're playing. This is what coach wants. So how do we get there? All right, so I'm challenging them to take ownership. And then when they actually say, well, I'm, I think we need to do this and that through the right strategy, what often happens is then I achieve buy-in and or accountability because if they don't do that, then the problem's with them. Then it's not my problem. It means there's something else going on. And the other thing, obviously, is minutes. I'm not sure what level you're coaching at there, but the minutes that you give to your athletes is a reward for not only their effort, but their buy-in. I mean, I say to people, don't focus on if you're the starter on my team. If you want to start in a basketball game, that's not a measure of how important you are to my team. The, the real measure is whether I put you on the court in the dying seconds of a game where the game's on the line. That's when you know your value to a team, right? That's the most important thing to be aware of. So here's the thing is it's built on trust. So if you're a player in my team and I don't think you've bought in, then you're probably riding the bench in the dying seconds of a game because I don't trust you to be part of that process to help us get the win, which is sad, but it's, and I tell my athletes that, that's the other thing is full transparency. At my academy, we have a statement of standards, which came to me not from my own thoughts, but from the fact that Coach K gave the United States team a statement of standards. And I thought if it's good enough for the US team, it's good enough for me. So what is a statement of standards? It's a list of things that we say, these are the things we expect of each other. 
and we hold each other to account when we don't actually achieve them. Now, if people don't want to buy into that standard, that's fine. It means our program, our team is not for them. You don't meet the standard that we have for each other. See you later. But at least it's transparent and clear and it, it, everyone's bound by it. I, as a coach, am also bound by it. So that's a response to the first question that you actually ask there. I'll just have a look at the second question or second part of it is how do you get junior athletes to understand how important it is to come to training with intensity and purpose? That's obviously my logo. I'm just going to, this was a longer email, so I'll just read a bit of context here. I've tried to explain to my junior athletes on a number of occasions on how important it is to come with a positive attitude and to understand that the way that you train is how you play on game day. So, you know, if there's no energy at training and they mess around, that's going to affect the way they play on game day. So 100%. So there's a saying that your only obstacle may be attitude, right? So your athletes need to understand that if they're not getting opportunities and they're not winning games, then the problem might not be the coach, okay? They may well be the problem that's stopping themselves from achieving what they actually want from not just this sport, but in life. So if they've got a poor attitude to training, then that's gonna carry into every aspect of their life. So, you know, some players are gonna be respective to this concept of being a good global citizen, others aren't, right? So this is how I have my academies. I want people to be good people first, basketball secondary. That's actually how, you know, I don't mind getting rid of players that, uh, that bad apple that potentially will spoil the rest of the group. So what you're talking about here is two aspects, the one which was buy-in, and then you've got this second aspect of training, right? So the way you also plan your training, you're responsible for what I say is having the standard of expectations of how you train and that you need repercussions when you don't meet those expectations. So example, for this year, our academy has a theme. So I theme every term and I also theme every year. This year's theme is raise the bar, right? So I am saying repeatedly to my athletes, our goal here is to raise the bar. And I ask them, who raises the bar? Who raises the bar? So if you think about high jump, who raises the bar? Well, two people. It's you, the person who's making the jump and hopefully clears it and raises the bar, or the person who went before you. So as a group, we've got to realize that we're all responsible for lifting our game. And if one person isn't raising the bar, no one's getting better. So this concept is really important to understand at the team level that, you know, another cliche saying, I'm, one of my players used to call me coach cliche, but, you know, a rising tide floats all boats, right? Rising tide floats all boats. So we want our weakest player to get stronger because we know when our weakest player is stronger, we're all stronger. So that's all I can say. As far as technique, intensity, purpose, so that's actually, if I go to the next slide, actually, this is interesting. I brought this, when I saw this email, this came to mind. I'll just bring this up. So this is actually the playbook for my academy. The saying you'll see there, buy in before you stand out, right? That's what you're trying to get your players to realize is that they're part of a bigger picture here, that they can stand out once they're bought in, but don't buy, don't buy in, then don't try and stand out. You'll stand out when you know what you're doing. It, ha it just happens naturally. It's a nat natural sort of attrition there. So buy in before you stand out is what I would say to athletes and try and sell them on the point that we're trying to achieve a bigger vision here. And hopefully you got good leaders in your group, then they will buy into making sure those other teammates buying because they have some influence there. So one of the things that as, as you get through the levels, what you come to realize is a lot of junior coaches are teaching drills and plays and skills, but they forget that they're actually dealing and coaching human beings. And I learned this late, I must say. And I'm, when I say late, I mean, tw I've been coaching 30 years and I probably learned this 10 years ago, that you got to learn to coach players first, that they're people, they're motivated by different things. And if you can work out what motivates an individual into action or inaction, then you can actually get a better buy-in and a better outcome from them. So that is today's live stream. Today's focus has been on shooting. So if you enjoyed what you saw, make sure you give it a thumbs up, leave a comment in the comment section below, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. 
Now, if you haven't been here before, then my goal is to help others improve, to help both coaches and athletes improve. How do I do that? I do it through my academy, which I have here in Australia, and also do it through Auswish Education, which is where I work with schools and other organizations to help them improve. And I also run coaching education accreditation courses here so that local coaches and phys ed teachers can attain their club coach accreditation. If you need to get in touch with me at any stage, you can check out all my socials are linked here on the YouTube channel. Thanks, take care, have an awesome week, and I'll hopefully catch you in the next one.